Shall we start? Okay. Welcome to um, the mineral physics tutorial, the second one. We're going to talk about the physical properties of composite material. For us, we care about rocks. It's really good that this morning you heard uh, Patrick's talk. Right now, we actually do really well from the theoretical front as well as um, experimental front that uh, we can measure or calculate the uh, elastic moduli or other physical property of minerals in general well, okay? But rocks are polyminerallic. Rocks have mineral, has various faces, including uh, interstitial fluid. So when you are looking at uh, seismic images or when you are doing modeling, geodynamic modelings, you cannot ignore, you are looking, not zooming in to look at a single mineral phases, you are looking at a composite material. So to get the composite material physical properties, we started with the elastic moduli because of, you know, with the seismology being the most powerful tool for us to probe the interior of the Earth, what we get is a VP, VS, and how you, you have seen how that's related to various elastic moduli, okay? So to get that moduli, when you're dealing with composite material, you need a basic three ingredients. The first is elastic moduli of each of the constituents, all right? That includes different minerals, interstitial fluids, and the et cetera. Second, you need to know the volume proportion of each phases. These two often we can measure in the lab. The third is the distribution or the geometrical details of how this different faces are sit next to each other, okay? How they are coupled. It's fair to say the third, the three-dimensional geometrical details are the hardest to get, to measure. We are not the only one face these problems. Material scientists, Make, um, people who look at the medical science, they all need to know these 3D structures of whatever the interest of the object. In geoscience, it's fair to say that the three-dimensional imaging to look at the really detailed geometrical distribution of various faces, I think it's started mostly by oil-related uh, um, applications. Showing here is a paper by Dworkin et al. published in 2017, um, 2008. Um, the top are the oil sand and the bottom are the tight gas sand. So that they get the 3D geometrical details. Now with the computer powers, you can compute different flows, different properties. And another thing is you can actually compare it with laboratory uh, measurements to verify those calculations and that gives you some predictive power so that you can actually quantify the physical properties of composite materials. And you can see that this is complicated and uh, Patrick alluded to this morning that for single minerals, he did beautiful calculations. Now we almost like, we don't need to measure it. We can calculate them, all right? But once you add more faces, that calculation becomes really expensive, really slow, and it's still, um, they work um, ongoing. So right now, because of the um, advance in imaging and also the exponential increase of power, of computing power, we started to also use the 3D imaging, and uh, this is what we call the digital rock physics. And uh, I'm going to show you very quickly a couple examples that uh, we do. Not only you can take naturally um, occurred rocks, you can also now um, 
do synthetic rocks. The good, um, one good thing about doing synthetic rocks is that you can control the conditions and you can actually simplify the phases, all right? So in this case, we are doing partially molten rocks. This is simply a, um, olivine with a middle ocean rich basalt, and then you can do the 3D imaging and it gets the um, 3D geometrical details, and you know now each phases, all right? And uh, plug in its uh, different uh, physical properties and uh, doing some of the um, simulations, you can do virtual experiments and uh, calculate the um, property. So in this case, one example is to calculate the permeability. Once you have, in this case, uh, the partial melt, which is MORB, that's it. The 3D structures, uh, distributions uh, within a olivine matrix, right? And uh, then because now the imaging itself becomes the flow path and the boundary conditions, so you can actually do finite elements uh, of various other um, simulations and plug in the Stokes equations and get the flow velocity at every single um, element and then calculate the total volume flux which gives you the permeability. So showing here is essentially a video that um, gave you the result. We'll start by looking at a 3D cube which is a sub-volume of that uh, partially molten peridotite, all right? And um, you see that the light gray faces, that's olivine grain, and the dark gray faces, that's melt. Because now you have the 3D digital image, you can basically binarize the image. And since this is only a two-phase system, that you can have the melt channels mapped out. And now imagine you're a chemical species that's following the fast path, all right? You can now see what, where it goes and how fast it goes by uh, superpose different uh, pressures at both ends, and then the flow is going to drive, and that you can see where the fast flow velocity, uh, red here is the high flow velocity, uh, just don't confuse with the seismic tomography image you have been looking at over the last few days, and the blue is the low velocity, all right? So right now you actually can do with the digital uh, physics, if you give me the 3D geometrical details of different phases, and if we know the individual, we know the individual uh, phase, the properties, you're going to be able to get a, a lot of details out of that. And the cool thing about it is you can do different physics processes on the same rock. In this case, we also look at the electric conductivity, and now obviously the physics is different. Instead of the Stokes equations, you have the Laplacian equations, and uh, you, instead of Darcy's law, you have Ohm's law, but you can calculate the conductivity. And now, because measuring permeability is in general harder, Whereas measuring electrical conductivity, we have a little more, at least at a low temperature and low pressure, we have a little um, easier way to get it. So in a lot of uh, places that we try to relate the electrical conductivity to infer the permeability, okay? That is when the, especially the interstitial fluid has high conductivity than the solid phase. So in this case, now with the virtual experiment, you can actually compare whether you are able to um, see them. How do they compare whether you, the relation would have any physical basis? So showing here again is a binarized uh, um, image of the partial molten rocks, all right? And what you get is on the left, this is a fluid, all right? So that's uh, green, blue. On the right is the uh, electric current, that's uh, red and the yellow, all right? The high flux is 
blue and the high current is red and the uh, gray background, so that's the melt network. All right, so by looking at, by doing the simulation, you can really see the differences and the similarity of the um, conduit, all right? And we do see differences, and you, if you actually calculate the tortuosity or the flow path, they actually show quite a bit of difference. So this will give you some confidence about how do you actually empirically relate um, conductivity to permeability. And the reason they are not very, they are, they are similar but not uh, identical is because of their dependence on the hydraulic radius versus the electrical um, uh, radius is different, okay? So right now we are also uh, looking at the elastic moduli by doing the um, comp either uniaxial compression on the blocks or cyclic loading on the blocks, right? So you have both the olivine and the melt, and they have different moduli. So that now I'm showing here is a work in progress that by loading it, you start to see this is a plane swept through the volume that the you see the melt is a low shear regions, and the sum of the green green content has a high shear regions. And by doing this, we will be able to look at the uh, Bach modulus, shear modulus, especially, which is harder to measure, right? And so, might be able to also look at the attenuation if the computing. Right now, even though it's really powerful, but once you do the cyclic loading. It's, the calculation is really long, and uh, we're still working on that. This is powerful, however, if you look at uh, where we are in looking at the 3D volume, all right, 3D geometrical detail, we can, one of the coolest thing right now is you can look at the atomic scale, both the 3D structure and the chemical composition. However, you look at the volume, the material you cover, the region you cover, is tiny. So these samples usually are really a tip, and then they actually essentially evaporate the atoms one by one or several, and then detect them to get the, to get the uh, 3D distribution as well as the material property, all right? And then when you go uh, up a little more materials, you need the electron tomography, essentially use the transmitted electrons to go through thin materials, and then the uh, FIB, FIB SEM tomography, and then the X-ray microtomography, and then uh, micro CTs and so on. So you can see that this is actually quite expensive, quite um, time consuming, and um, also sometimes you're just not able to get the CT scan of the object, right? It's uh, um, by length or by time you're limited to say, I cannot, I don't even know, I, I don't think I've ever seen a lower mental piece of rock that I can put into my CT scan and get it. So how do we go about? It? So this is the tutorial about, all right? We're going to do a little different. Um, so first, I'm just going uh, through this uh, bond. So now, without knowing the geometrical detail, what we know is individual faces uh, physical property. We also need to know the volume proportion of each individual phase. And now what we get is essentially we try to find a reasonable average that represents this material, all right? It started with the Voigt and Royce average. This is a strictly started empirical, all right? You basically say, hey, I have material. They are different, and they are different volume proportion. A general rule is that they 
overall the material would be an average of those materials. You can also add a power of a, um, power law of a certain numbers, right? So a simplest one will be the linear one. So the power n equal to one, and that is the void bound, all right? So you summarize it, this gives you the upper bound, and uh, the lower bound would be what usually also referred as the harmonic mean, all right? And so that gives you a lower bound. And the Hue average is essentially, he took either arithmetic means or geometric means that gives the average. When later on we'll do the um, spreadsheet, you actually see that a lot of times that geometric mean that come up with Hue all right, you came up with that, is right in the middle of the void and the Roy's bound. That's why you get what we call the void Roy Hill average. And this has a, a geometrical interpretations why this is the upper bound and why that is the lower bound. In this case, you can see that uh, if you have two materials, all right? The composite are made of two faces, all right? The dark uh, purple and the light blue case. If they all very nicely ordered, all right, parallel, and you apply stress, in this case, you squeeze it, all right? Every single face will experience the same amount of strain, shortening, all right? And that's why it's the isostrain cases, right? And the stress, on the other hand, would be, remember, stress will be force divided by the area, all right? So the stress is actually the sum of all. So the composite, in this case, would be the, the say, the Young's modulus will be the stress divided by the strain, but the strain is the same, so the denominators are the same, so everything sum up, that gives you the upper bound, all right? Whereas if you flip it 90 degrees, now look at it, every layer experiences the same stress. And the strain, the total shortening, will be each layer's individual shortening added up. So in this case, the stress divided by strain, the top, the numerator is the same, all right? divided by the strain, and that's why the sum is the uh, minus one power, okay? So that gives you the lower bound. And you now can argue rock doesn't usually look like this. It's true. So the improvement then came about is the hashen strickman bound, all right? This is a beautiful idea. It's Somewhat, if you squint your eyes, it starts to look a little bit like the rock structure, right? So essentially, this is still a two-phase material. You have the purple and the light blue. One is a sphere. Another is a shell around that sphere, okay? So this if the stiff material is the shell, the shell is always having a, a physical property of one. Shell is one, the sub um, footnote is one, and so the sphere is two, okay? Then you can actually derive what will be the composite material's uh, effective moduli, and that this is the formula, all right? So, this is the shell material, all right? If the shell is a stiff one, then the whole thing is stiffer, that's the upper bound. If the, uh, this is in case that the sphere is the softer one. If you inverse that, you have a softer shell and a harder course, then that gives you the lower bound, okay? And you can play with this when we have the Excel spreadsheet to see how the bound is actually uh, fallen in between the void and the roid bound, which is not so it should be, okay? So the void and roid bound actually gives you the largest difference. 
And the, the Hessian streak man, actually the upper bounds and the lower bounds, gives you the narrowest string. Okay, so if you average that, so that's what we call the effective medium. Okay. Then finally, I just want to um, get you to get ready for this idea that uh, even if you have the same geometrical structures for different physical properties, the formula can vary a little bit. So the idea is the same. For example, we showed you the um, transport property. So instead of thinking of ISO strain versus ISO stress, you can think of these materials are parallel connections and uh, serial connections. Thinking of them as you have uh, highways when flow can go fast, and then it's a narrow, winding, crowded way so that uh, has bottlenecks. All right. So whether if they are parallel, then we can always say, oh, I'm taking a different GPS is telling me going another way, so, so I can still go fast. All right. But if they are serial, they have no choice, and you, the narrowest um, bottleneck is going to control your. Um, physical property. And then when that happens, all right, you have the, um, essentially, the parallel connection gives you the arithmetic mean, which is uh, like the void bound. And then the serial connections gives you the harmonic mean. And so when the material is randomly distributed, Ted Madden actually had a really seminal paper to demonstrate that so the geometric mean is usually the best to describe the average um, velocity, or in this case, right? So that's a geometric mean. And the Hessian streak bound, you will see that this will be the highest bound, lowest bound. Hessian streak man, the higher bound and lower bound will be right in the middle, whereas the geometric mean is in the middle. With this, um, we will do the Excel sheet. In that, you can look at the bulk modulus, shear modulus, how they change with the contrast, with the um, Young's modulus and the Poisson ratio actually change how you mix them and the where they should plot. And then we'll do a little differently instead of uh, always looking at a computer screen and trying to follow, put the numbers there. We're going to look at different composite materials. All right, we're going to have sponges. Sponges with little compressible, all right? They are actually viscoelastic material. You can see them gradually relax, all right? And, uh, and sponges with more stiff um, pressure. And then you can actually do the mixing, all right? With, you can see uh, we have our really precise stream measurement. We, each one of us have a ruler, okay? And then you can, we should then report our data back. You will see if we didn't get our measurements, like Ved says, when we were drunk, all of our points should be in between the upper void bound and uh, the lower roid bound, okay? And if your calculation or your experiment fell way out of those bounds, you know, maybe you had a little bit too much to drink. With this, I'll have Lohan to show you the Excel sheet, and then we have six stations right outside on the patio, so that you will use the cinder blocks to press. All right, you can. You're going to measure your strain, and we will come back and look at them. Okay. So Uh, make a few changes as I'm going to show you. So I'm just going to actually take a cinder block.
block by you. And he dropped out of science because his results were so boringly similar to the self-consistent, you know, effective medium theories. So I'm wondering, have you seen like different scalings from any of these finite element models? I realize that for some of these, there are no good theories around. But particularly when we are looking at elastic moduli, right? There's a bazillion, you know, coarse graining approaches that give you whatever shear modulus incompressibility as a function of crack density and something like that. And some of them are pretty good, right? And I, I just wonder. It's you actually mean that uh, when you simulate uh, based on this uh, rock structure, right. you actually get to reproduce what uh, the model tells you. Yeah. Isn't that great? No, it's nice, right? But sort of, uh, but we, we, that's, that's good, right? And so people who've used the theory before are happy, obviously, right? And until we simulate in the computer, we don't really know, of course, right? But these things, you know, tend to be really, as you know, really expensive, right? And then you need to create a big ensemble, right, to to reach the level sort of confidence. And I just wonder, based on your initial experiments, right, do you have an indication that commonly used, whatever, you know, coarse graining approaches don't work? That's my question. Okay, so with the one thing with the part we start with the partial molten rocks is that to actually measure the permeability is really hard because the um, melt is really viscous and uh, to drive the viscous flow you need a really large pressure gradient when you have really large pressure gradient you actually deform the material which violates Darcy's law. So you cannot uh, separate the rheology behavior from the hydraulic behavior, all right? So when then you do the geodynamic model, you have nicely the uh, mass conservation, momentum conservation, then the uh, porosity change and so on and so forth you actually don't have a good way to say what will, should be that K and what that K is related to the volume change. So with this, you see now you can actually calculate it. For us, the first thing is, uh, it is the result is consistent with the thermodynamic prediction, which is a good thing because with the 3D imaging, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty related to that, right? So, so that's one thing that's good. Right now, one um, challenge for we are doing is to look at, for example, the uh, bulk modulus and the shear modulus, or VPVS. If I understand it correctly, look about it at, in the lab. All the VS you measure, right, is high frequency. We do ultrasonic. You don't measure ultrasonic. So somewhere that's uh, attenuation is frequency dependent. So we actually don't know how to extrapolate the experimental result to the seismic observation. Do, don't people do these torsion experiments and they're pretty close to the seismic frequencies? Isn't that what Willie Fowl does and what people have done for a long time? I'm not sure because um, the, when we do at least the VPVS ratio, what you do is you have uh, ultrasonic, the piezoelastic uh, um, voltage and they go through the, the, the material, right? So for that, you actually have, you always need to extrapolate, like Patrick show, that you have to extrapolate the laboratory frequency or grain size to the Earth's mental frequency and grain size. 
So one thing that I see now, we certainly are not there. You are very welcome to come and help. That uh, you have one way with the digital physics, uh, rock physics, just like Patrick did, that you can calculate, which then can be scale independent and uh, have a broad frequency domain. I think that is a great thing to add to, um, may lead to some more understanding. For example, right now, if you have a really thin boundary that has a fluid, what do you think the shear modulus will do? Uh, it's really going to be frequency dependent and the size dependent. And sure, and but I guess unlike viscosity, right, shear moduli seem to be more accessible to actual experiment in terms of the frequency oh. content. I guess you disagree wow. with that. I would like to respond to Torsten. I won't be articulate, but I'll try to be more efficient. Right? These bulk properties are the response or characterized. We're not being recorded, so it doesn't matter. Oh, okay. Uh, the bulk, these effective medium solutions are the result of microstructure. That microstructure may have an origin to a set of physical processes. And so by measuring a bulk property, you get insights into potentially the processes that create that microstructure. So the microstructure is produced by nucleation and growth. Nucleation and growth, nucleation and growth doesn't necessarily occur randomly, but there's some structure and order to it. And so there's insights into computing the bulk properties that give you insights into And these effective medium theories make an assumption about uh, what that structure is and the topology. Right. I mean, just to clarify, I'm what? not saying we shouldn't do that. I'm just saying, is, are there any effective medium theories that are already violated when we do these experiments? Right. That, that was my question. I, I think one of the things we learned, for example, in our simulation with conductivity, we end up with a mixing relation based on those digital rock physics approach. And you could look at it, and you could actually capture it with some of those N members. However, these N members, all of them, have an underlying assumption about the distribution of the materials. Well, we know that's not the right answer. That is, we actually see what's the distribution of the, of the, the two materials, and it's much more complicated than the N members for which we have these analytical expressions. So sometimes, yeah, it looks a lot like one of those N members, but the subjacent origin for it, why it does that, is not right. You see, the, the end member has a, an assumption on geometry, and that turns out sometimes to be a red herring. Right, but so, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Well, it does matter, because if you take the end member uh, relations and find a mixing, with your, you, you will have a certain relation. And now, if you want to get it back to our data, you would have to, you could still use the end member, the, the mixing relation, but you would have to ch do the wrong end member um, relations, like say your melt is actually well, more conductive than it really is. Okay, so sometimes if you're using the N member of mixing re relations, you end up inferring properties of the N members, which usually are not that well known either, and those properties are wrong. Now you take this error and you're moving out to the large scale, um, you know, to the real earth, your error blows up. Not to say that there's no error in the way we approach the, the system, but typically when you look at it from different angles, eventually we hope to convert. Okay. I also noted my first paper was exactly the kind of thing. So I have no problem with Good. So I, I'm going to uh, give you a very quick tour of these spreadsheets, and then we're going to actually play with uh, form and, um, and blocks. So this is spreadsheet actually it was very much inspired by the geochemistry uh, tutorial the other day. Um, and so there's a lot of things in the background which are like intermediate calculation. I forced myself to do this in Excel because I figured statistically more people are familiar with Excel than MATLAB, although that's what I would have used. Um, anyway, so what's going on in here, in principle, as a user, all you need to worry about are the, uh, the cells that are in, yellow, in green, sorry. And so, in particular, in our experiments that we're going to do out of those magnificent analog materials there, uh, you're going to be calculating essentially the Young's modulus. Now, you probably all are aware that there are many elastic moduli that depend on the way that materials are being loaded. The Young's modulus essentially is the unilateral compression, something like that. So what we're going to do 
you take one of the uh, one of the blocks, you measure its thickness to know what it's like at rest. Then we go with our sophisticated loading machine, put it on it, and ideally you have a little bit of distortion that you can measure on this. Now you take the displacement that you just measured. I'm going to write this here. No, I can't. Uh, yes, I can. So then the strain is simply going to be the displacement over the original thickness. And the uh, Young's modulus, I'm going to call it E for now, is going to be the load over, the over that strain. Right? Now, what is the load? Ideally, I would want to tell you exactly how many newtons or uh, pascals are included on this. I haven't bothered to calculate it, but in fact, it just doesn't really matter. The load is going to be one cinder block, so I'm going to call it CD, uh, CB, cinder block, over that strain. And in that way, you have a modulus which is expressed in units of cinder blocks, which ought to work. So that's the number that you're going to put in, um, in those uh, boxes here for the first material and the second material, etc. Um, now, the mixing, especially for the hashman strachman bonds, is done rigorously using the bulk modulus and the shear modulus. So we first have to make a conversion of Young's to bulk modulus so, uh, and shear modulus, which should be done automatically if you address those numbers. You also need to know what the Poisson ratio is. For most material, 0.3 is a good first guess. Doesn't have to be right for forms, by the way, but we're just going to use that for now. And so this spreadsheet should uh, right away give you what is the bulk modulus and shear modulus of the end members. And then you have a series of proportions there, and the various averages are calculated. You can go back in the spreadsheet to figure out which, uh, how each one of those uh, is actually conducted. And then the graph that you see there show the various mixing relations. Uh, and remember, uh, you know, idealized mixing relations that when Lou just uh, introduced us to. The void bound is this blue line here. The Royce bound is this one here. So ideally, nothing is going to go outside of those bounds. Cross your fingers. Um, the void Royce heel average would be this green line. The two Hashman Strickman bound are uh, the blue and orange lines here. The uh, purple one is actually uh, the logarithmic mixing that's really being appropriate more for permeability and transport properties, but just for kicks, I'm adding it here just to see what it does. And you can see essentially that wherever your lines are, you can, wherever your measurements are going to be, you can kind of um, pick up whether you're close to one of those bonds or not. Um, there is a space up there for two measurements. That's your uh, green and uh, boxes here. And essentially, the idea is to take a sequence of those forms, right? And you can stack them first in this configuration with the cinder block on top of it, then in this configuration with the cinder block on the edge of it. And ideally, one of them corresponds to the void. This exactly the configuration which is assumed for the void bound and the other one for the voice bound. So if you do this two loading, and then you report your Young's modulus in that table here, ideally, you're going to get one of those points on one line and the other one on the other line. Again, cross your fingers. Um, other things that are shown in here, um, because we don't have to just stay in here, we can actually make some prediction then, for example, of the seismic velocities. I, uh, assuming that there is a, a density of one, I didn't want to bother with the, um, um, you know, saying that those two forms are different densities, but you could play with that. You should be able to calculate the VP and the VS of the assemblages. And where is the, this? This should be on, on here, but this is a version of, Word, of Excel I'm not familiar with, so something's vanished. Here are the prediction of VP, VS. And just because that's something that actually we care quite a bit in terms of finding out the presence of fluid and things like this, the ratio of VP, VS is going to be shown here for, again, all of those various averages. I should say on here you have the two points there that correspond actually to your uh, measurements here. So let's say that, for example, um, I, I just made up numbers to start with, but let's say that your first one actually did not go 30 but had a, a 15 uh, cinder block units 
for the Young's modulus, you can see how the blue points moved. So you just have to change um, the values correspond to actually your measurements and your experiments, and those points should be moving around. Same thing here. Let's say that it was not 100 um, cinder block units, but only 50. You can change that, and in principle, all of those lines are going to uh, adjust to your input. So in principle, you only need to play with the green boxes, and things should work. Um, one thing, actually, which is fun for especially seismologists to think about is this VPVS plot. Um, and you can play also with the Poisson ratio here of the two end members to see how that will actually affect uh, the VPVS uh, plot here. If in this case, where the Poisson ratio is the same for the two phases, it's very, there's very little variation in here. So essentially, there's no, the second phase doesn't change the VPVS. But if we make a phase more and more incompressible, which give you some guideline up there. Incompressible is essentially a one half for the Poisson ratio. If we put it very close to one half, let's say 0.45, you can do actually 0.5. You can see how these plots now start to dramatically change. And so, for example, the presence of a fluid that will be incompressible in here changes to the PVS um, in a very uh, remarkable way. So you can play with these spreadsheets in terms of seeing what those uh, idealized mixing relation does for the properties of the of the assemblage. And then in a few minutes, we're actually going to measure it and see that it's hopefully it's going to work. OK? Just as a hands up, there's also a second shape on permeability, but that's the same story. And we don't have a way to measure permeability here, so I'm not going to yeah, worry about it. OK. At any rate, I think we have half an hour. And we'll separate into 45. six uh, groups. So each one the group will have a set of sponge tops to play with. And um, you can do various configurations. And you can also borrow your neighbor's uh, um, sponges and uh, try to do different mixings. And uh, we'll see that that's, uh, when we have all of our data get together, that's where you start to see the uh, actual averaging start to emerge. So we have six stations outside. So if you want to come and grab a sandwich of sponges, so <laughs> Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Group leaders. For the Those are for kicks. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. What is that? What is for the Ah, uh, yeah. It should be. We should have six. Somebody have two.
guys have any more rulers? Or is it just the one that's out here? We should have six. Oh, okay. With six groups. I don't know why. Well, that's what it is.
Yeah. For like the for like the rocks. Yeah. Some of this unique <laughs> where wine has come from. Yeah, exactly. I get it for free. Yeah. Terroir. Yeah. Yeah.
maybe we can take an Uber. Oh, they're rematching. That's great. <laughs> it's good.
Okay, so we have five more minutes. Um, did every group get what they wanted to, to measure? How was it? How was it? Does it behave like what you expect it to behave? I heard some yes. Can people no. who say no <laughs> is um, so? Do I have anybody who actually see them actually jumped out of their bounds? If you measure the two material, the white sponge and the yellow sponge, and then you do the mixing, and the, actually your mixing value is outside of your individual values. Yes. Yeah. You thought about why. That's the experiment. So why? What do you think you went friends. wrong? I don't know. What do you think could, I, I'm sure, because I see a lot of you went back and uh, remeasure things. So what do you think might go wrong? Because the, the thing is constrained on all sides. That's one thing. I think that's the first thing. Remember, I put the blocks, all right, the, the red bricks, all right? Those I deliberately not giving any uh, instructions like how to use it, why those red blocks are there. Right? So if you build a cage for your SpongeBob, right? if you actually constrain it tight, that's started to be a confined experiment. You're not allowing the sponge to actually extrude. This is a Poisson ratio. You're measuring as modulus, right? You're doing the uni actually. The, lateral should extrude, right? So depend on how you actually squeeze it, how consistently you're squeezing it, your measurements, you see, you, you try to squeeze in this direction, but you're confined in that direction. Your material will be more rigid than when they are not confined, okay? And so if you don't take that into account, so remember our Reading's a little bit rough too, okay? You could potentially, I think that's the biggest source of error. That's one thing, okay? And that's how you refine and uh, doing experiments. Having the conceptually a great idea does not mean you can show the world that uh, something can happen. Can you think of other source for the error? We're, we're assuming that like a simple stress, maybe the stress is getting kind of concentrated in different ways that we're not taking account. Yeah, it's certainly the size because we actually try to cut it to, to be precise. It's really hard to, to cut. So the, it's not always the same um, height. All right, and then also the, it can buckle. That's what we didn't take uh, into account too. Okay, so that's another source of error. The third source of error is actually between them, we'll, you actually have a layer of air. Okay, and uh, that is the third phase of your material. And we certainly don't take into account of that all right, so. Yeah. The, the free boundary you have there depends on how tight you actually put, press them together. That could contribute a lot to the um, final uh, shortening too. 
All right. So a lot of this, this is just a simple example. But so when we do experiments, so that we do it in a high pressure, high temperature lab. But so these is also things that we actually need to take care, to take into account. And also when you have a high pressure, a lot of times the pressure and then that actually introduce extra frictions and extra shortenings and uh, so on and so forth. All of this need to be taken into account. And uh, if you enjoy this type of work, maybe you can also think about doing some experiment. Okay, so we have one minute left. I just want to show you very briefly. Um, I have, a, I essentially went to my coats and get a vase. All right, so then I pour some glass beads in one, and then I pour fine sand in another. So can anybody have a guess which one has a higher porosity? If you don't know porosity, porosity will be the air volume, in this case, the pore volume, divided by the total volume. Any guess? This one has a higher porosity. This one has a lower porosity. Actually, if I have a balance that if I put there, you will see that these are roughly the same way. You can come and feel they are roughly the same way. And since this is sand, roughly, this is the coarse, and this is glass beads, roughly the same density. So the same weight means that you have the same solid volume if you have the same solid volume because the total volume is the same, your pore volume is the same. So they actually have similar porosity. And then in terms of permeability, how permeable they are, which one do you think is more permeable? Clearly this one. <laughs> Okay, and that's why you you all heard about uh, shale, right? Shale has really usually large porosity, yet it's really hard to get the gas or oil to flow. It's because the pores are really small. So permeability and porosity are related, but they're not always uh, positively correlated. One last fun thing is that if, so they both have Porosity, about the same amount. I actually can, here's my more sand. I'll be able to pour sand into the vase, okay? They just disappear, okay? You see that? So clearly now, with non uniform grain size, because the fine sand can get into the large pores, you can build low porosity. That's why clay materials tend to have very high porosity, yet they are impermeable, okay? But if I want to pour glass bead in this, I don't have room, right? So with the very last thing is uh, philosophical, we end there. This is your day. You want to fill it with important things, that's the large bead first. Then you can fit the trivial things, that's the little fine stands. And uh, if you do it with the trivial things to fill your day, you don't have time. You cannot fit the important things into your day, all right? And uh, finally, you feel the important things and you did the trivial things. You, if I have fluid, I can pour it in. That would mean that no matter how full is your day, you always have time to have a drink with friends. With that, you can go have your coffee. A question. Yeah. Is it always or in general true that if you have a, uh, a a material, a composite material with different size grains, then that you will always have lower porosity. Than Tend to be have. true. Okay. Yes. Fine. That's a, cool. if you look at the marine sediments, all right. Fine sediments if, tend to have uniform grain size. If the uniform grain size and the packing is similar, right, 
then they tend to have similar porosity. But you have a broad uh, green size distribution. It's the fine material that defines the throat, all right, and uh, defines where the porosity is. Yeah. Thank you.